250. How I love the great Redeemer who was doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story on the love that makes men free till my earthly life is ended. I will send sons above and beside the Christ sea. Praising Jesus and his love. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me and everything shall always be. I will never but cease to raise a song of gladness in his praise here and in the world above my soul shall sing of saving love life and light and joy is he the precious friend who died for me he has purchased my redemption, rolled my burden of sin away, and is walking on beside me, growing dearer day by day. That is why I sing his praises. That is why. Joy is mine, that is why forevermore On the everlasting shore I shall sing of love divine He is everything to me, to me He is everything to me And everything shall always be I will Never cease to raise a song of gladness in his praise. Here and in the world above my soul shall sing of saving love. Life and light and joy is he the precious friend who I for me, glory be to him forever, endless praise as to Christ the Lamb. He has filled my life with sunshine, he has made me what I am, oh that everyone would know him. Oh, that all would adore. Oh, that all would trust the love of the mighty friend above. And be his forevermore. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me. And everything shall always be I will never cease to raise a song of gladness in his praise here and in the world above my soul shall sing of saving love life and light and joy is he the precious friend who died for me? He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me, and everything shall always be. I will never cease. To raise a song of gladness 
in his praise here and in the world above my soul shall sing of saving love life and light and joy is he the precious friend who died for me good morning I would imagine that it is pretty obvious that I am not uh, Andrew Harrison. Uh, we had announced that uh, Dr. Harrison was going to be here today. Uh, he is the minister of the Simpson Street Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the oldest congregations in that, in that city came out to visit his son, who lives in Carlsbad, uh, California, which is, uh, some of you know, he's just this side of uh, Oceanside. And uh, Dr. Harrison is 80 years old and developed a serious hip and leg problem called me last night and they had to get the doctor off the golf course uh, to come and to uh, work on him. And so he is going to uh, return to Atlanta uh, to take care of his problem and sends really his regrets. His wife had already picked out his sermons. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so I ask that you would uh, forgive him for not being able to come. Uh, but uh, he said that he would uh, buy an airplane ticket when he got well and just come just to be with us. I don't know, he's been here before uh, some time ago. I don't know if any of you, many of you know him. He is uh, a former Solicitor General for the state of Georgia, also a, a judge in the court system, a lawyer, a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the uh, military and a preacher, served also as Chairman of the Board of Trustees uh, uh, directors of Southwestern Christian College and I could just go on and on and on and since he's not here I'm gonna send him a nasty letter um, and that's how close we are we can talk about each other and then laugh because then we start comparing other people and find out we're not so bad after all <laughs> amen but it's always good to see all of you. Some of you look so tired. Did the picnic wear you out? <laughs> My Lord. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw one brother and one sister packed up that plate with ribs so high. Uh, I just went, what in the world? I'm going to share this with somebody else. <laughs> somebody need to repent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it was an exceptional uh, outing yesterday. Uh, Victor Williams, he's here somewhere. Where are you, Victor? There he is over there. Put it together. Uh, I'm sorry, brother and sister Williams, not just Victor. Uh, his great uh, companion and helpmate, his wife was just right there uh, telling him what to do, and he wouldn't do it. But it's so good. And then Vacation Bible School. Lord have mercy. Um, brother, brother and sister uh, Moore. Uh, our hats go off to him. And, and his team uh, that uh, is really uh, uh, on the ball. Uh, and I was saying to somebody, I said, they set the bar really high. Now what you gonna do to beat this? But knowing these young creative minds, 
they're going to come up with something that is going to be even greater and draw us even closer to the Lord. God is good, isn't he? And, and then all of the, uh, all of the uh, underwear that's going to be taken to uh, the uh, uh, homeless shelter, uh, you set a goal for 2000 and uh, it, it exceeded it by a hundred and eighty two so it was two thousand one hundred and eighty two pair of underwear uh, it's interesting because you never know who you're going to serve uh, who you're going to meet I I was here uh, yesterday and Friday, and a phone call came in, uh, really a busy time, and this man was on the phone. I don't want to embarrass him. I'm looking to see if he's in the audience. If he's not here at this service, he'll probably be here at the uh, 11 o'clock. And so when I came on the phone, he uh, gave me, uh, you know how you drop names of people that you both supposed to know? And so he did, and that got my attention. He called the names of a couple of preachers in uh, New York City and said, uh, I'm here uh, in Los Angeles, and I've fallen on hard times, and uh, I want to go to church, and I found you on the Internet. And, uh, and he says, I'm in a shelter right now, and uh, I, I just want to... Uh, come to worship and I want to come to the vacation Bible school I want to come to the great Crenshaw cookout and so I asked him what shelter are you in and he named the one that we are supporting and I said Lord have mercy you are helping people who are of like faith and you never know uh, you never know you never know Take your Bibles, if you will. I have a long sermon this morning. Y'all relax. Take your shoes off. And, uh, no, don't take your shoes off. Oh. Uh, if you turn to the book of John, uh, John the uh, sixth chapter, uh, John chapter six. I want to read uh, a few verses, beginning with verse number 41, uh, John chapter 6, and verse 41. Have you found it yet? It says in verse 41, at this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said I am the bread that came down from heaven they said this is not Jesus the son of Joseph is this not Jesus the son of Joseph whose father and mother we know how can he now say I came down from heaven. Drop down to verse number 48, and it says there no one has seen, uh, verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Would you all please stand for a moment? Would you all stand on, uh, stand on your feet for a moment and, uh, and, and, and then turn around and shake somebody's hand? Don't go far. Just turn around and shake... Uh, somebody's hand. Amen. Give us one of those verses. A good verse? Yeah, a good one. 
Let me know when you're ready. Uh, give us about one minute. I love to praise him. I love to praise him. I love to praise him. To praise his holy name, cause he's my rock. Yes, he's my rock, my sword. Tell you, he's a wheel in the middle. I know he'll never, never, never. He's just a jewel, a jewel that I have found. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah, I love. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, I love the praises. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, I love the Oh, the to praises. There was a man, uh, in Chicago who asked an author by the name of uh, Cecil Adams, who was considered to be one of the world's smartest human beings. And he asked him the question, can a man live on bread and water alone? The answer was not what he expected. Cecil said, on bread and water. A man can live just long enough to wish that his life was shorter. My brothers and sisters, it is really a fallacy to believe that you can survive on bread and water alone. This, this diet, this sparse diet, will cause uh, a massive breakdown of the human body and slow death. But first, we ought to take a look at the good news. If you drink enough water, you'll slow down the approach of death. Even though there is so much water in bread, about 35%, most bread also contains about uh, so much salt that a great amount of water is needed to flush the sodium out of your body. And without water, you will become uh, hyponatremic. And if I didn't say that correct, 95% of y'all didn't know it. <laughs> but the word is free. It means that you got too much salt in your blood. And so if you acquire uh, this condition, you would vanish into a coma. In about 10 days, you'd vanish forever. Somebody is already thinking, I, I just love to eat low salt bread. That's fine, but low salt bread uses a lot of potassium chloride to keep it from collapsing. And too much potassium chloride is also a danger to your health. And, and, and then there's the problem of finding a, a nice room somewhere with a steady temperature of 65 degrees and relative humidity of 60% in order to keep you from sweating out the water while you eat 
the fresh bread. And finally, there's the fact that you have to consume about six one-pound loaves a day to fuel your body. And, and so in theory, at least, it would seem that you could survive. But then there's the problem of a lack of protein and, and vitamins. If you were a rat, you would be sitting pretty because rats manufacture their own vitamin C. But humans must consume vitamin C in their diets. After six weeks of a lack of vitamin C, you end up with scurry, a side effect of which is a loss of appetite. Now you have to force yourself to eat six loaves of bread without an appetite. And then comes the, y'all can say amen to this one, the aching bones and, and joints. And then, uh, then your gums will begin to bleed and, and your teeth will start wiggling in your mouth. And at that point, you have to switch to a diet of tasteless, soft, white bread. And your skin will get very thin as you become anemic and uh, your hair will begin to split and coil and, and bury itself in its own follicles. Your body will not know, to, will not know what to do with the 8,000 calorie a day diet so your urine will clog up with glucose and overtax your kidneys. I, I'm scaring somebody here. Then your, then your blood pressure will go completely out of whack as your body collapses on all fronts and you come open to any and all infections. And if you are happy to reach the six-month mark of this diet, you might wish that you were dead. Now, I think that we all uh, agree now that no one can survive on just bread and water. So doesn't it seem strange that Jesus would offer himself as a sufficient supply for survival as the bread of life and living water? Uh, it, 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 maybe if he had said, uh, I am the roasted lamb of life and living wine, Maybe we would have more takers. I, I'm not trying to be humorous or even uh, sacrilegious here. I, I, what I want to do is to engage you into some thought, some thought process about Jesus' choice of bread and wine as a metaphor. The truth is that if even, that even if Jesus had chosen some other choice menu, for his allegory, man was already doomed to die on his present diet, which not only included what he put in his mouth, but also what he feasted on with his eyes and what he served to his terminal soul. And all of the fanciful menus in the world could not and would not change that. It was going to take a supernatural spiritual food to quench man's insatiable appetite for sin. A man uh, preached a sermon uh, once, and the title of this sermon was called Wonderful. And, and the preacher said that there are two hundred and 56 names given in the Bible for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I suppose that this was because he was infinitely beyond all that any one name could express. Yet Christ, the God-man, the man of men, and a God for all men, supplied his three-course supernatural meal without a price and is the bread of life and our living water. And so with the main course, Jesus saved us. 
Another man wrote a book called Living for Eternity, and he describes the plight of sinful mankind. He says, had Adam and Eve retained their original state, they would never, they never would have died. But Adam, but Eve, and then Adam, uh, yielded to the serpent's temptation, and death came into the world. And before that moment, they were in a beautiful, pristine state. They existed on a level far above the present condition of the human race. It is difficult to imagine what man was like then by viewing him as he is now. It is hard to look back and to say uh, man was in this beautiful state. Because when you look at us now, you'll wonder what it was like then. It will require somebody uh, like trying to, uh, re to rebuild the original version of, a, uh, of an airplane that had crashed in the desert. If we knew nothing about flying, we had never seen one before, and we came up on a, a crashed airplane, and we put it back together, not knowing what it was like before, I wonder if we could ever get it back to its original state. The material would be the same. The capability of the flight would be the same. But there, it was still could not do it. Man... Man, God's creation, was doomed to spend eternity separated from his creator. And since his fall from grace in the Garden of Eden, man's life was filled with sorrow, it was filled with tears, and the promise that he would suffer eternal death. In fact, the word refers to our plight as the bread of sorrows. Psalms 127 and verse 2, and the bread of tears in Psalms 80 and verse 5. This was the daily bread that formed so great a part of life prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, Jesus did come. He came. He came, the scripture says, as a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He gave himself a ransom for the redemption of man's soul. Jesus, Jesus saved us. And with the next course, the main course is that Jesus saved us. And the second course, the next course, is that Jesus sanctified us. Once man was saved, he had to be cleaned up. And, and sometimes we get it backwards. We want to get cleaned up before we get saved up. If you're out in the desert and you are in mud or you are on the top of a mountain and you're lost and you're, and, and you're just drenched with sweat and mud and tears and all of that, and, and then you say, before I can go to the place where there is refuge, let me take a bath. The moment that you know that you're going to be saved, you go to where refuge is, then you take a bath. The bread of wickedness, the bread of deceit, had to re be removed from his decaying body. For man to be sanctified, he had to be washed in order to be made whole. In, in, in 1818, a man, uh, a doctor, a medical doctor by the name of Samuel Weiss was born into the world from a dying woman. The finest hospitals uh, uh, lost one out of six young mothers that were in labor to a disease called, known as childbirth fever. In those days, in those days, research said that the doctor's daily routine, y'all listen to this and I hope, it, I hope it makes you feel a little nauseous, his his daily routine began in the morgue where he would go in and perform autopsies. And there he made his way to the hospital.
to examine expectant mothers in labor. But from the morgue to the delivery room, he never washed his hands. He would go from the dead body to delivering a baby and never stop to wash his hands. And Samuel Weiss was the first man in history to associate these examinations with the infections and the death of mothers in childbirth. And so he practiced. He started the practice of washing his hands with a chloride, uh, chlorine solution. And, and after 11 years and the delivery of over 8,000 babies, he only lost 184 mothers. One in 50, an improvement over one in six. What am I saying? That there are some people that need to wash their hands before they walk into the house of God. There are some people he need, who need to clean up their minds and get rid of the junk, the dirt, the bitterness, the anger. Amen. All of that stuff. That is causing your body to rot and your mind to atrophy. This man spent the rest of his life uh, lecturing and debating with his colleagues about this condition called childhood fever, saying, for God's sake, wash your hands. But nobody believed him. Virtually no one believed him. The doctors and the midwives said uh, no outspoken Hungarian was going to force them to change. This man died insane at the age of 47. And they threw away the wash basins. And his colleagues were laughing in his face. And the death of thousands of women ringing in his ears. A simple washing could save many. For more than 2,000 years, men and women have been rejecting the need for their own washing. And even though a simple washing by the blood of Jesus can save many, men and women continue to die in sin. King David said, wash me and I'll be white as snow. John the Baptist cried out in the wilderness, be washed and be made whole. J -J Jesus told Peter, Unless I wash you, you'll have no part with me. And so, my brothers and sisters, for God's sake, we need to be washed and cleaned up, especially through the blood of Jesus. Jesus saved us, and he sanctified us. But then it's time for the bread of life and the living water to give us our dessert. And so with the last course, in Jesus' final selfless act of service, he solidified our future by filling us with the Spirit. After salvation and after sanctification, man was ready to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you want the gift of the Holy Spirit, you get it when you come up out of the water. Once a man is saved, once a man is sanctified, he's ready to give over the control of his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is controlled, it is controlled by consent. No man.